Hey folks, welcome back to the Overmatch Podcast. I'm your host. As freaking, I'm gonna get Kirsten to do more podcasts, man. She's good at it. She's a good personality. So today, back to Irish history, right? We have uh, young Doctor Ushin McIlvany on the phone from Ireland, uh, in his doctor's office right there. And nobody's gonna walk in behind you in a gown or something, are they? Because I don't want to see that. Gowns are gross. I don't know why you guys use them. Um, so Ushin, thanks for being here, brother. This is this is. Uh, is it, it's really cool to get you on the phone. I know you're a busy man. I know, no bother at all. Uh, yeah. Have to be there. You're, you're treating the sick over there. You're a respiratory, that, that's your specialty, right? So COVID would be one of your things, right? That that whole respiratory. All no? that kind of stuff. All that kind of stuff. Yeah, all the good stuff, you know? All right, you obviously don't want to talk about doctor shit, so we're going to move on. Um, the uh, But I appreciate you being here, man, taking the time. So uh, I just got back on Friday night from, you know, Marine Corps. I was like, uh, can you do a, a podcast with Oshin on Sunday? I was like, sure. I like talking to Oshin. So here we are, and I have absolutely no idea what we're going to talk about. So maybe I'll shut the hell up and just let you talk. What are we talking about today? Uh, we're talking about the IRA intelligence war with Michael Collins. Okay, cool. This is the period of history you love, man. You love this war of independence stuff. You love uh, what, what, what draws you to it? I know. I mean, it, 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 I suppose it's it's the development of a new type of warfare, which is intelligence-led urban guerrilla warfare. Just yeah. interesting to see it take place almost in real time. You know. Yeah, yeah. Of course, intelligence has been part of warfare since the beginning of time, right? But, um, and it honestly wins battles. It wins wars, right? It really does. The 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 people with the best intelligence, and there's some fascinating examples throughout history, but. As the IRA developed in in the, you know, up to and, and kind of around World War I uh, and then beyond it, uh, how was that structure built in, inside the, 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 the IRA kind of thing? Was it something they'd taken from before or was it something that kind of they fixed as they went along? I suppose it's a bit of both, you know. I mean, like, uh, the, the, the precursors of the IRA and who existed alongside the IRA were the IRB. Mm -hmm. So um, the Fenian Brotherhood, like we talked in our previous podcast. Uh, these were essentially, if you're going to use a modern day representation, they'd be very similar to the CIA in an intelligence gathering organization. Uh, and they would have occasional uh, sort of moments where they'd have outright rebellion or assassinations. Uh, but the IRA basically... The Irish Volunteers, which became the IRA, was essentially set up by the IRB, by Thomas Clark, by Sean McDermott. And while they didn't take any sort of big roles in the IRA themselves, they were very high up in the IRB. Uh, and so they really sort of introduced the intelligence network structure. Uh, this was taken on by Michael Collins later on, developed, molded towards its task, particularly with regards counterintelligence and assassination. Okay. Um the, did a lot of these guys fight for the British in World War One, or were they so anti-British that they, they wouldn't do it? I assume some of them did, maybe not at the higher levels. Yeah, well, I mean, quite a number of them were in the um, in the British Army, actually. And, and if we're going to look at, like, uh, 1916, quite a lot of the high-end guys were former British Army soldiers. Really? Like, people didn't expect. So... James Connolly, who is sort of an Irish public socialist type, he was a member of the British Army. Um, Michael Mallon, also one of those, uh, from his kind of political background as James Connolly, also a member of the uh, British Army and was very heavily decorated. Mm -hmm. um, Thomas Clark, his father was in the British Army. Um, you had countless people, even during the War of Independence, you had uh, Tom Barry, uh, British Army. Um, and also, unfortunately, the person who actually killed Mike Collins in the end, um, uh, Sullivan, was also a British Army sniper. You know, so really, yeah. So, so mm. they, they they had to. The best thing for a guerrilla army is to know the techniques and tactics of the invading force, and that's what they did. You know. Yeah. Um, you know, you 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 sit back and go, okay, these guys freaking hated the British. Why would they serve in the British Army? They probably grew up young men seeking adventure, uh, no jobs. No future. You can't really blame them, right? There was no Irish army. Um, 
So I, I, I doubt a lot of them went there with an eye to using all those skills later on in a revolution, right? They probably just went for adventure and to do something that they were drawn to do, right? Yeah, I, I think that that was certainly a part of it. Um, and I think that, that's something in, in military cross world that appealed to most young fellas, a sense of adventure, a sense of purpose. Yep. Uh, to live a life less normal. Mm -hmm. um, camaraderie, right? Kind of brotherhood, camaraderie, yeah. Um, I wonder how Irish people, Sorry, go ahead. I, I think the big thing for the for the Irish that particular time, and it was very, very commonly mentioned, was uh, by James Connolly, who again himself went to the British Army at a young age. Uh, it was uh, conscription by starvation. So, I mean, right. like, uh, mm -hmm. they used to openly promote this on their recruitment posters in the British Army that you had a higher chance of dying in the slums of Dublin from cholera or typhus than you would in uh, the Somme. You know, so. Wow. Yeah. Conscription by starvation. Holy crap. I actually never heard that before. That's crazy, right? Um, all right. So we're talking about Collins specifically. So let's let's uh, let's talk about his early kind of years and how he became that the the top intelligence guy, he became very, very good at it. Um and actually became the top guy because he made at least he was blamed or given credit depending on what side you, you 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 sit on for the whole separation of the British from the south of Ireland into the north of Ireland so he was the guy who had to make a decision and stamp the table and uh knowing actually I think he said at the time somebody said this is probably this probably marks your political death warrant or something he said it probably marks my actual death warrant I don't know what the phrase was exactly but it's something like that so let's go back to the early days um and kind of kind of talk about how he ended up his journey. Yeah, so so Mike Collins was born in, in Cork in a place called Sam's Cross, very rural agricultural area in 1890. So this still, still is in the shadow of the Great Famine, the hunger, and that yeah. decimated. So he grew up, his father was a member of the IRB, he was a Fenian. Uh, but despite being and I, I think you probably know this yourself, uh, you know, from growing up in Ireland, you had a lot of people who were very, very intelligent, but they just weren't educated, you know? Yeah, my mother was like that. My mother went to school, what they would call here, uh, like primary school. And she actually never went to secondary school. So at the end of primary school would be something like middle school here. But she was a highly intelligent woman, man. I could organize things and was very, very smart, but just never had the education to to fine-tune it you know yes yeah, same with my, my 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 grandparents you know they never got mm -hmm. any education outside mm -hmm. primary school but yeah. very smart mm -hmm. and, and mike collins's father was very similar he was an amateur mathematician incredibly well read and in fact when the british as a reprisal burnt down his family home they looked at all the books that they had in the home and were surprised that they were a brainy family from cork you know yeah you know it's it's that kind of racist uh looking at a culture and giving them no credit that bites people in the ass when they have to fight them, <laughs> right? And, and an example of that would be, um, people are going to hate this, but I, I think, um, if, and there's tons of examples of throughout history, but I think because you underestimate the enemy and the British did that in Northern Ireland for the whole time they were there. They, I think maybe near the end, they were like, holy crap, man, these guys know what they're doing. But there, there's examples of that throughout history. And and it, it really is to your own detriment, man, I tell you, yeah. And, and you know, it, it's funny, we were talking about in the last podcast with the Invincibles, they used to do this uh, study of phrenology on the Irish, where yeah. they looked at the school and they said, well, they're kind of deficient, you know? Yeah, yeah. It's no pat on the back if you're getting your ass kicked by a deficient. <laughs> That's true, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, but there's there's been examples of that throughout history. Yeah. Um, but I, I have seen that in my uh, my parents and grandparents, very highly intelligent people that just never got the education that that, that would have really helped them. Yeah. And uh, Collins came from, again, like like most Irish families, you know, a large family of around eight tenant farmers, uh, but he grew up in this kind of republic. Oh, Shane, just explain what tenant farmers are real quick. So basically, you don't own the land. You, you, you're you leasing out a very small plot of land to grow potatoes and subsist off of that. You know? Right. So 
basically before the, the British invaded Ireland, right, you did own the land or your ancestors owned the land, right? And then the, the British came, took all the land and then chopped it up into very small plots and rented it back to the people who's, who previously owned the land, right? That's a tenant farmer, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, and like, you know, uh, he grew up in this kind of Republican milieu there. Like, I mean, one of his most influential people that he met was the town blacksmith, uh, James Santry, a guy whose entire family uh, spent their lives in all the previous rebellions forging weapons for those rebellions. So he, he grew up with this kind of um, the mythos of a, a potential free Ireland, you know. Uh, but, you know, he got to a certain age and like most fellas in Ireland, he realized there's no money here. Uh, there's no chance uh, to get ahead. So he moved over to London and joined the civil service. Now, when he was in London, he was introduced to all these Irish kind of circles, like the Gaelic League, so the Irish Language Speaking League. That's still there. That's still a thing, right? Oh, it is, yeah. The yeah, Gaelic yeah. League, yeah. Hmm. And the um, the London GA as well. And, and in there, he met someone very, very important, a guy called Sam McGuire, which the name of the cop is uh, after. Uh, Sam McGuire was a Protestant Irishman who lived in London and was a prominent member of the London IRB. Mm -hmm. Uh, so essentially he brought him in at a, at that young age around, I think it was around 1910, he brought him into the IRB. And from there he started to go up the ranks, start building up his reputation as a very intelligent young man, very, very high level of organizational skills. Uh, and by 1916, about six years after that, he'd risen up the ranks where he was financially advising armed shipments in via Count Plunkett, uh, and had become, uh, I would say through the mechanisms of Thomas Clark, the, the mind behind the, uh, the the Fenian Brotherhood at the time, and Sean McDiarmid, who's a very close friend of his, and Tom Clark's protege, he was moved in to be the aide-de-camp of a very important man called Joseph Plunkett, uh, one of the leaders of 1916. Mm -hmm. So while he was a junior enough guy in the I IRA, he was a very, very well-connected member of the IRB. Yeah, you're talking about... Uh, like 26 years old, right? He's He's up there... Yeah, rubbing elbows with the top guys. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And um, so, like, you know, as, as we all know, um, uh, the, the the rising ends in failure. Uh, and uh, and Collins isn't can, like... Oshin, can, can you talk through the Easter Rising? Just, just like, the two-minute version. Sure, sure. Um, mm -hmm. Just for people who don't know, right? Yeah. So so the, the 1916 Easter Rising is like the Irish version of the Alamo. Um, so or the Tet Offensive. Like the Tet Offensive. Offensive, right? Yeah. It was like open peace battle. Let's do this thing, right? Um, at the time, the British Army were one of the most well-equipped and professional armies in the world. Probably standing toe-to-toe, -to -toe, not a great idea. <laughs> no. No. All right. Um, and the idea was there was supposed to be a, a, a nationwide rising, but because the Fenians, one of the, one of the weaknesses and the strengths of the Fenians is they're very, very secret. They put a figurehead in charge um, of, of the uh, of the Irish volunteers of the IRA, and he made a countermand order which totally scuppered their plans. So basically, overnight it was reduced to a Dublin affair, and it was doomed like from the start. But they went ahead with it anyway because they realised there's probably even if they all died, it was symbolic enough to invigorate the rest of them to to go on ahead. You know, and and in in. Uh... Kind of similarly to the Tet Offensive, it was a failed military operation, but it probably led more to the U.S. leaving the, the Vietnam than anything else because people were like, holy crap, the American embassy in Saigon is being overrun, right? We, what the hell is going on? So it, it was, even though it was military failure, it, it did lead to the British leaving probably more than any other mission. Is that correct? I would say so. I, I, I think it was the, probably the very, uh, Tom Clark himself said it was the very first successful blow for Irish freedom. And I would say that in con conjunction with the Irish War of Independence, it was probably the very first blow uh, in the British Empire as a whole, because shortly after that, you start seeing India break away, the other colonies break away as well. Yeah, and that was, we talked about this before. It was also, you know, during World War One, there was that class system where they just churned working class over the trenches to get mowed down with machine guns and people from all kind of colonies of the British, British 
empire fought there, right? They were forced to fight there, and they got killed in huge numbers. And you saw people going, oh, my God, this is ridiculous. You know, why are we doing this? Um, how long did the Easter Rising last? Just about a week. But, you, you know, what you mentioned there earlier on was very true. It's it, uh, this kind of idea of just moving men against bullets uh, in World War One. They use that in the Rising as well. And there was a sniper, a Fenian sniper called Frank Scholdice, who did a memoir of it. And he couldn't get over that he killed about 50 men who just kept marching. Yeah. It was old school tactics against new weapons. That's what it was, right? Um, that Yeah. I, I, you think like number 49 would have been, I'm not going out there. You can shoot me. I'm not doing it, right? Um, but it, it, it's funny to look back in hindsight. Like even a civil war in America, like they're all lined up in line shooting at each other. I'm like, nobody thought to lay down, right? Come on, man. <laughs> Um, yeah, old school tactics in World War One over the trend into machine guns changed everything, right? But but people got mowed down, and working class people got mowed down. Um, and it kind of changed a lot of mindsets in Pakistan and India and all these British colonies, you know. Um, so it was a week long that basically took over some of the biggest buildings in Dublin, correct? And they said, you yeah. know, go ahead. Yeah, no. You... They took over some of the biggest buildings and they also took over some strategically good ones as well. Like the GPO was the telecommunication center of Dublin, yeah. which they took over. Yep. Uh, the, the problem that some leaders had, which was, it was a, just a mistake, is they believed that the British would never shell the sister city of the empire, which is Dublin. And they yeah. shelled the ship. They did. They brought a gunboat up to Liffey, correct? And just hammered. And you can still see all the shell marks and bullet holes in a lot of those buildings. Uh, what's your buddy's name that does the walking tour? Oh, Lorcan Collins. Lorcan Collins. Yeah, if you take that walking tour with him, he'll probably walk you past there, I assume. And he'll show all the bullets from, from the, the 1916 Rising, which is super cool. Um, so they come up. The British hammered them, basically. And uh, they're probably out of ammunition by the end of it. Uh, a lot of wounded, um, but a lot of Dubliners, Irish people in Dublin were against the rising, right? Yeah. So a lot of people in Dublin, particularly in in the sort of um, the slum areas there, uh, were uh, all the, the dependents, basically, the, the, the children and the wives of British soldiers. Really? Um, wow. And also you had yeah. Toronto, which was the biggest red light district, which and the biggest... Uh, per, uh, the, the biggest amount of people who actually pay money for a red light district in any country will be the soldiers. Yeah, yeah. Hey, yeah, you're right. Yeah. Okay, I resent that. I don't deny it. I just resent it. <laughs> Where was that? Where was the red light district? Uh, the Monto. So that was Montgomery Street. So it's just, it, it's not too far from the GPO. Mm. And it's not too far, you know, if the Rotunda area there as well, like biggest slum in Europe at the time, you know, so... Uh, you, you created, it's almost like an abusive relationship. You make people dependent on you um, by abusing them and depriving them, but they'll never let you go because they're dependent on that little bit, you know? Yep, yep. We, we see it to this day. Um, and we see it in America. Um, so, yeah, so they thought that the Brits would never shell the city. Did the Brits try to take back some of those buildings initially before they shelled the city, or did they just go to cannons right away? No, they tried to take them back by force. They they, they got ambushed a lot. Uh, so uh, on Mount Street, but I, I I think about 150 were killed uh, trying to get over a bridge. They were realizing it was very difficult to get into an urban area to attack an urban area. Yeah, well, narrow streets that were not built. That's why this some of the streets in in Paris are huge. It's because after the the French Revolution, where they lynched all the all the aristocracy, uh. They, they, they built the streets big so it'd be harder to block. You know, interesting tidbit, right? That's so that right there, Rushing, that's useless information out. And some information you need to know as a doctor just went out of your head right there. But those old cities like Dublin that were built freaking, I don't know how many fucking a thousand years ago, right? The, 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 the Vikings freaking started Dublin, right? So that narrow streets. Um, very easy to block, and there's very famous pictures, and, and we'll put one up on this, but on the YouTube channel, but of um, the Easter Rising, where they had furniture and everything all blocking the streets, and then of course it's the home turf, it's the home turf for the Irish people there. They know all the best vantage points. They know um, 
it, it very, I mean, an urban fight is a hard fight anyway, um, especially against an enemy who knows the terrain better than you do, right? So the Brits, they come in, they try to take it, try to take it, um, and then uh, I, I guess they just said, ah, screw this, man, let's just fucking hammer it. And okay. essentially, the, the end result of 916 was the, the main leaders, including Tom Clark and importantly Sean McDermott, who is probably one of the closest friends Michael Collins had in the IRB, were basically lined up along with the other signatories of the Proclamation of Independence and executed by right. a guy called Maxwell. Um, now, there was a decision to be made about other important members of the IRA at the time. Uh, thankfully, Michael Collins was decided there, there, to be very honest here there was huge gaps in british intelligence mm. uh so despite e even to this modern day the, i think the the main goal of british of, of intelligence services overall is to give the impression they know everything at every time about everybody mm. but it's just not possible and and you you miss huge gaps so while they may have had update information on open organizations like the irish volunteers or later to be called the ira they didn't have a huge amount of information on the IRB, the secretive underground organization. Mm. So they assumed Collins was a low ranking member and he wasn't sent off towards more secure facilities. He was sent off to a prison camp in Frongoch in Wales with mm. other members, low ranking members of the IRA. Mm. And he was pretty high at that point. Well, he was very high in the IRB, but they had no clue who he really was. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, um, they didn't even have a photograph of him, did they? Uh, later on, because they didn't know what he looked like. Is that correct? No, so it's interesting that I've heard that a few times before, but in fact, not only did they have photos of him, they had videos of him. Okay. Uh, yeah. They, and he was he was unusually tall for an Irish person, right? Because Irish people right here, not not like six two normally, right? He's a big man, right? He's about uh he's about six foot even. Yeah. Uh, Devil was very tall. Devil was like six foot. Six. He was a really man. He stood out in a crowd, literally. Oh, he did. Uh, if you ever see the photo of him as a young man, like I mean, like, it, like he, he his father is Cuban, right? Mother yeah. is Irish. Yeah. But he was totally different from every other Irishman you've ever seen. You know. Right. right. Yeah. 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 Um. So Collins gets shipped off. I mean, they they executed all the leaders, right? Wasn't there a guy who was like so wounded he was on a stretcher and they stood him up or something, or they put him in a wheelchair and shot him? So uh, uh, James Connolly got shot in the ankle and um, it had gone septic at that point. So they tied him to a chair and shot him in the chair. Yeah. Um, which, which at the time was seen as uh, incredibly bad uh, form in, in military surroundings to shoot an injured prisoner. I, I know it seems kind of counterproductive, but like, you know, to shoot an injured prisoner, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know how many got executed? Oh. Uh, I don't want to put you on the spot. Huh? Uh, so the the the, the initial pro, uh, signatories of the proclamation were executed. I think I think approximately seventeen people were executed as well. They killed people who weren't even involved massively in the rising. So like Pork Pierce's brother Willie Pierce was also executed, as well as people like um, uh, McBride who got involved in the rising on the day of because they just really hated him for his role in the uh, South African War when he was a commando out there. Mm. Okay. The um, so it eventually just got shelled and and so much they all, they surrendered, right? That that's how they roll them up. Yeah. So that's that's how that's how it happened. And the the worst mistake the British made was that they shipped off all these young fellas to the one prison camp where they could educate each other and learn. Very similar to the troubles in the north when they send them off to the 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 ke long cash. Yep. And yep. They didn't yep. educate right. themselves. You know. Yeah. Um. Yeah, they still do that. Um, let's talk about intelligence on the battlefield because here's one of the mistakes the British probably made, I assume, which have been made anytime you're an occupying force, right? That's not your home country, right? So intelligence people go in, they go for six months or a year, uh, and then they go home, right? And and we did this and everywhere, the US military did this everywhere we've ever been. It takes years and years to build up an intelligence network. And if you're switching people out on a regular basis because they have lives, then, then you're losing something every time you do that switch over. That's, that's just the way it is. And the Brits probably did that. Um, I know they had people living openly in Dublin, like intelligence agents, and they weren't behind secure walls either. They were openly living in houses in Dublin, correct? 
So, so it's interesting you say that. So they had several different, um, uh, several different arms of intelligence out in, out in, in Ireland. So they had the RIC, which was the cornerstone of their intelligence network. Mm-hmm. Um, most people they think, oh, that's just police, but the RIC were basically a paramilitary force. They're what, was, always, what does that stand for? Uh, Royal Irish Constabulary. Right. Mm-hmm. You know, their counterparts became obviously the RUC in the north, but yeah. They were they were a paramilitary force, um, and they were basically constantly surveilling the local population. Um, now they had specialized groups like G Division, which were for um, political and counterinsurgency work. They had Dublin Castle, where you had basically MI6 was working out of there, and then you had British Army intelligence as well. You know. Were they talking to each other? Do you know? A lot of times, these different networks, they're, they're all trying to hug the information. And this is what happened on 9 11 in America. They're all trying to keep their little things secret and they're not really cross promoting and, uh, you know, talking to each other. And they all have the same information in different ways. And that's how intelligence is done, right? I take a little bit here and a little bit here and a little bit here. But none of those pieces mean anything unless I put them all together. And they probably weren't putting them all together very often. That's kind of how it happens. That's very true. I mean, like, uh, not all, uh, it's same uh, back then as now in any uh, theater of war. I mean, like, I think it's safe to assume in every organization, everyone's infiltrated to a certain degree. Yeah. Not all uh, organizations are uniformly on the same page. There are doves and hawks in both of them. And sometimes they're actually working against each other. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep. Um, and that, that has happened. Throughout Northern Ireland and a lot of a lot of theaters around the world, right? So, so call How long did he go to prison in in Wales? So they let him out really early because they thought he was such a junior member. He got out around December of that year. Really? So only a in there. That's a light sentence for a revolution. <laughs> wow. The thing is, though, they thought he was such a junior member. They thought thought he'd be no harm at all. Yeah. Uh, and the more senior, serious. Um, political and and revolutionary people were held for much longer. Yeah. So for example, De Valera, who is much higher up in the IRA, but nowhere uh, involved really in the IRB, um, was sentenced to a maximum security prison. He had to be broken out by Collins. That's men right. Later. Yeah, that's a great story too. But um, uh, so he only did a couple of months, and he get out. What what happened then? So it, it, it was very interesting. So. As I was saying earlier on, he's, uh, Collins was very tightly connected with the leadership of the IRB, who really are, you know, they're the Fenian Brotherhood, they're the people behind this whole rising. Uh, so he was a close friend of Sean McDermott, who was Tom Clark's protege. And when Tom Clark was was executed, for the very first time, the Fenian Brotherhood had a female leader, which was Kathleen Clark, his wife. He basically mm-hmm. had entrusted his wife with all the details to hand over to the next person. And Kathleen Clark... Uh, put Michael Collins in charge of the National Aid and Volunteers Dependence Fund, which was basically financial networking to arm a rebellion. Mm-hmm. So he signed off, and th- this is where you'll see the video of him signing off the first national loan where he's helping people get back to work after the rising, you know? Mm-hmm. But in reality, he's trying to source money to fund a revolution. And basically between 1916 and 1918, he's setting up his intelligence network uh, he's working alongside another young fellow called Liam Tobin, his second in command, and they're getting spies, multiple spies, in Dublin Castle, people like Nelligan. Uh, in G Division, they're getting people like Broy, uh, and they're getting lots of different people through innocuous means. So like people who work in um, society pages, uh, photographers, anytime people would sit down for a photo, a soldier with a pretty woman, take a photo, I know who you are now, uh, I know where you're living uh, and who you who your inner circle is. You know, mm-hmm. they had a woman. They had a woman in Dublin Castle, right? She was a cleaner or something like that, who gave them a lot of intelligence. Women are awesome at intelligence. They just are, um, because mistakenly, people think they're a low threat, and that's just not true. Anybody who's been married knows that. <laughs> um, I'm kidding, um, but they're very, very good because men act stupid around women. It just it's it's in our DNA and men like to freaking talk and women are awesome at intelligence and people who like um, people who now even say, oh, women shouldn't be in special operations and women shouldn't do this and this. Do you ever see two? I said this to somebody. Do you ever see two Green Berets walking around a shopping mall in the Middle East 
trying to look normal with their tattoos and they're freaking walking around. They're all jacked up and they're like, we're but a man, a woman, man, nobody passes an eye and you know, nobody, buys. so, so women are awesome at intelligence. They're really, really good at it. Um, and, 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 and it, the, the fact that they were employing them is just smart. And the fact that they put one in charge is really smart too, because, you know, as she's less likely to get picked up, she's less likely to get interned and you have that continuity there. You know, I, I, you know, somebody that's going to be there to, to if, if uh, the male, if there's a big sweep and they all get sent to prison, right? You have that continuity. That's wicked smart. Yeah, I, I, it's, it's interesting. I, I was going to say, I mean, like, um, you know, that 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 same woman that you're talking about, uh, she used to be a, a typewriter uh, f uh, for them. So she'd be making copies of every single document of importance. Yeah. She also basically, they, they started... Over the, the course of 1918 to 1919, started picking off G Division, started dismantling G Division uh, through assassination, intimidation, etc. And so they started bringing in people from Belfast to head up the operations in Dublin. So they brought this guy, Redmond, uh, head of RIC Special Branch in Belfast, to come in and shake things up. Within two weeks, due to the information given by that woman, uh, Paddy Daly, the head of Mike Collins' squad, assassinated him. Mm. Wow. Yeah. Um two up in the capital and killed, you know. Yeah. <laughs> That's uh, hey, I got a new job. Woohoo. <laughs> two weeks. Boom. All right. Um Intel rules a battlefield. It just does. Um at what point did the um the Cairo gang show up and you know, you had the twelve apostles assassinate. What kind of time frame are we talking about there? Or are we jumping ahead if, if we're if I'm jumping ahead, just we we'll get to it, but Collins gets out of prison in Wales. Uh, and, and sets up this finance network uh, from there. So we're saying like probably from 1919 to 1920, things are trying to ramp up. So um, British intelligence are, are realizing there's something different happening here that they hadn't seen in a long while. And, you know, it, it was Fenianism. It was basically the Fenians of old that they're seeing tactics of assassination. It wasn't open warfare. It was intelligence led covert killings. Uh, of high-end military, police, and political leaders. Was, was there, there any was there any effort to win the hearts and minds of the Irish people? Well, you know, it's funny you say that. Like, so I was talking about, you know, that there's doves and hawks, right? Yeah. Uh, Some came in there. So there's several people who were sent in to to fix things. Uh, there was Alan Bell, who was there to. Um, he was a financial analyst, and he was there to basically nip the uh, financial support for the IRA. Yeah, uh, very, very complex banking networks. Uh, Collins realized who he was immediately and executed him when he, but a month into him being in Dublin. Yeah, uh, to make sure that because finance again is essential for any in, insurgency. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, and then there was two other people, sort of like the counterparts of each other. Uh, there was Andy Cope, who is the Dove essentially in this thing, where he wanted he realized maybe this person I can talk with and we can get a negotiated settlement because he was realizing there's no chance of having an overt victory here, military victory with these people. And then there was the other one, the other extreme was a guy called Ormond Winters, codenamed O, who's most certainly a hawk. Now, he his phrase for the Irish people, which pervaded most of the, the, the war of independence, he said, the Irish people had the characteristics of a dog and need to be treated with a firm hand. So, you know, um, Basically, Ormond Winters uh, probably had most control over the uh, war of independence. Mm. But as you'll see as the story goes on, probably Andy Cope's the reason why there was a truce in the end. Okay. Yeah. Um, was there a publication that the IRA had, at that IRB had at that point to, to try to spread uh, propaganda, essentially, or, or get the message out? Like they had later on with, uh, you know, Republican News on Fublock was, was the newspaper, the IRA later on. I think they had on Fublock back then too. They did, uh, yeah. I think they, I, I, there was a couple, they had, like the Phoenix had a ton of publications, but I think on Fublock was back then as well. Um, but, you know, it, it's funny, like, I mean, even Collins, despite how good he was, he was also infiltrated as well. So, I mean, like uh, the British had sent in a spy by the name, his real name was Jack Byrne, but he went by the alias Jameson. Uh, and he was he was basically from he was a British Army soldier. He had already infiltrated the London circles of the GA and the Irish Language Society. Those soft things that you can get into mm. without really committing to something. 
And um, he was brought over, all the right credentials, brought over to Dublin to meet with someone who was involved in the IRB. At that point, no one, well, people knew what Collins looked like. They didn't know what his actual role was. They realized he was involved in finance somehow, but they didn't realize he was essentially the director of IRA intelligence. Mm. So Jameson met with him and realized really quickly, everyone in the room is treating this guy with a lot of respect. This guy is important. And he was offering Collins a lot of weapons. So Collins was interested in him. Mm. But the people around Collins, particularly Liam Tobin, didn't trust him. In fact, Tobin wanted to execute him straight away. He's like, this guy's trouble. Mm. Uh, now, what Tobin did was essentially distance Collins from him and started feeding him a lot of false information about where to meet Collins. Sure enough, everywhere he said he was going to be met by Collins got raided by uh, military. Mm. So he knew he was he was the rat. Mm-hmm. So basically, he put him down uh, a laneway, put him on his knees, uh, said, we believe you're a spy, protested the very last minute, and eventually said, God save England. And uh, he was shot. Mm-hmm. You know? and, and that's just, that's the way it goes, unfortunately. Bro. Dude, that, that, that's a ballsy job. I mean, I, I, I don't care if you support the IRA or your, what side you're on. That takes some freaking courage, knowing that uh, to, to travel in those circles, knowing that even if there's a, a, an inkling that you're a spy, they'll err on the side of caution and put a bullet in you, right? So that takes some freaking courage. It really does. Um, the uh, I remember talking to uh, one of the British uh, guys who was in Somalia with me. It was uh, in, in he did intelligence work in Northern Ireland. He said it's scary, and he'd fought in the Falklands, man. He's an older guy. He's like the scariest thing he ever did was walk into a fucking IRA pub in Ireland. He's like, I was terrible, and this is no weak man. He was a huge dude too, and he was a badass. But uh, he was like, I was fucking scared. Um, yeah, that, that takes some balls, man. You got to respect that. You go in here, I'm gonna. I'm going to play it. And people do it today. People do it in the military. People do it on the law enforcement, do it. Uh, undercover cops do it all the time. Um, the, the risk may not be as much, but it's still, it, it still takes a lot of guts because you got to play that role and you got to play it perfect, you know? Um, I could have. It's funny because when you're when you're in special operations, you, you, you kind of, and it may not always be, that, you kind of hit a, a crossroads, right? And you can kind of go this way. And be a sniper and a door kicker and a breacher and do all that fucking bang, bang, bang stuff. Or you can kind of veer this way and do intelligence and run sources and all kinds of stuff. I never thought I would be good at that. So I went this way. And it's very hard to come back, right? Because they invest all these things in all these schools for you. Either way you go. So once you're on that path, it's very hard to veer back. But I, I never, number one, it didn't interest me. Number two, I didn't think I'd be good at it. And I'm obviously pretty chatty, but... Um, I, I, I think I wanted to do this other path more. Um, but I, I think in a lot of ways, that is the easier path, right? Put the charge on the door. Hope you built it properly. Bridge the door, go in, CQB, sniper, military free fall. They're all very tangible skills that this Intel thing is a very, very, um, fluid thing man because it's it's all personality and you gotta you gotta manipulate people and be good at that and i just never thought i'd be good at it honestly um but i i have a lot of respect for people who do it because it is tough um where was the money coming at this point was it coming from america and australia for the irb it's probably um, predominantly coming from america it was also coming heavily from london a lot of irish in london yeah uh, and, and and other places like australia canada other places like that but yeah. predominantly, you know, America, yeah. even to the most modern iteration of the IRA with NORAID and all these other groups, uh, funding came from America. Yeah, from pubs in Boston and New York and places like that, man. Yep, yep. Um, I remember being in pubs in London, in not in London, in uh, New York, and they passed the Irish pub, they passed the can around for freaking NORAID, right? I was like, what's this? <laughs> um, all right, so... Uh, so he's got good intelligence. Uh, what happened to the, like you said, he got infiltrated. How, how did the, 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 that was one way, right? Were there other infiltrations that got close to him? Uh, well, uh, it's hard to say, right? So the gentleman, uh, so while Orman Winters is heading up uh, essentially assassination units like the Cairo gang and another group, lesser well-known, the Iago gang, 
uh, to kill Collins. Yeah. Which were basically a special operations unit of their day, intelligence yeah. led to kill. Uh, Andy Cope was the dove, like, you know, that kind yeah. of mixed civil servant and intelligence work. Yeah. Uh, he met up with Collins and was having constant negotiations and talks with them. Yeah. So it, it, very similar to the, the most uh, most recent issues with Division IRA, despite people saying we don't deal with terrorists, yeah. they're always talking with them. Even Thatcher, who was a hardliner, she was talking to them. You know what I mean? They, but just politically, they don't they don't advertise it. Talk to me about the Cairo gang, where they got their name and what their job was when they came into into Ireland. Yeah, so so the Cairo gang, again, it was Ormond Winter's um brainchild essentially uh, uh very similar to the the mrf in the north uh basically these are plain closed uh, uh soldiers uh would be considered the elite uh of, of their of their background with regards to intelligence networking uh most of them were uh, brought back from mesopotamia so modern day iraq uh brought in from egypt as well a lot of people think they get the name because a lot of them are from the uh, Egyptian side of things, Cairo gang. But in fact, they had a front uh, called the Cairo Cafe on Grafton Street, mm -hmm. where they would go through dossiers of political leaders they're going to assassinate, essentially. Mm. Uh, so a lot of Sinn Féin people they're going to uh, bump off. And they went through all their little um, kill pack in, uh, in, in the Cairo Cafe. Now, the Cairo Cafe is only about 15-minute walk away from uh, the Confession Box, which is a bar which Co uh, Mike Collins worked out of. Mm -hmm. um collins basically ordered the squad uh to essentially eliminate um the cairo gang and you know how they got the intelligence i mean it's probably that whole network right the woman who worked in dublin castle it's probably a lot of different things right uh, there's a there's there was nelligan there was uh there was several people working in dublin castle uh but it, it, it was a combination of pooling resources essentially mm. um now they knew, who, and to be honest with you, I would say a considerable amount of intelligence came from London Division of the IRB as well, under Sam McGuire, who's head of intelligence there, mm -hmm. uh, because they knew who these guys were before they got on the boat. Really? Wow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, oh, that's, and and uh, the Collins had a hit squad called the Twelve Apostles, right? That's right. There's a great video on YouTube. I'm gonna uh, try to get my wife to splice it in here, but of a guy called Vinnie Byrne. Who's like old as dirt in the video, but he was like, yeah, he's talking about hitting these guys, which is crazy. He went up to the hall door, knocked at the door, and a maid opened the door, and I said, Could I see Captain Bennett? Or she said, He's in bed. So he's very important. I must see him. You brought down the two, brought down Bennett down to Ames, and I said that to them, you know your British spies. You know the the consequences if you're caught as a spy. Is death. And I said that's what's going to happen to you two men now. The Lord have mercy on your souls. So the two of them were shot. He like you know this here. Where is it at? Well, the Webley. This is what was used on a lot of them, right? The Webley pistol. Uh, this thing's a classic, and it was a gift from a friend of mine. But the old Webley pistol. This this was like very very pertinent at the time. Double action revolver, actually ahead of its time, but uh, this would have been one of the guns mostly used. Um, I'm sure there were others, but uh, that was a very prominent handgun at the time. Yeah, they were big into uh, the Webley and the 45 ACP round as well. For right. Point. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that was a new gun back then. That came out in 1911. Right. Uh, Mausers, I've seen some Mausers on some stuff as well. The, the, you know, the, the pistol with the mag on it, you know. Uh, love, I love old school guns. So they hit all these guys in one day, right? They went basically simultaneously and hit all this Cairo gang and killed them all instantly, right? That's right. So um, basically, bear in mind, at this point, Collins is in, and this is at the height of the war, Collins is in intense negotiations with this guy, Andy Cope, the, the, the dove, so to speak. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> But when you're in negotiations, number one, uh, you realize you have to be at a place of strength. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and secondly, uh, the other guy is still out to kill you. Yeah. And you realize that if he let his guard down for a second, these pe people would wipe him out. Mm -hmm. So get your revenge in first, so to speak. Um, so Collins basically organized a simultaneous hit early hours of the morning. Um, basically killed 
the British report 14 of their intelligence officers being wiped out. Uh, IRA reports at the time may may even double that, you know. Mm. Um, now, what happened shortly afterwards was that not everybody got away. Two, uh, three men were captured uh, the following day, arrested the following day. Um, three of the head squad? Well, this is the thing. So uh, two people who were involved in the IRA, potentially one involved in the hit squad, and another guy who's just a civilian. So it was guy uh, McKee, Clancy, IRA, and then McClune, who was just uh, an Irish language enthusiast, who was captured. Mm -hmm. uh, so they were brought to this place called the Fingernail Factory. Uh, it's on Parliament Street. And it's just across the street from Crow Street, where Collins's headquarters uh, are, mm -hmm. uh, right beside Dublin Castle. And uh, Orman Winters had a, a particular guy who went through for interrogations, a guy called Hoppy Hardy. Hoppy Hardy was called Hoppy because he lost his leg in the psalm and would walk with a hop. He had an artificial limb. Uh, and Hardy basically tortured these guys until they died. They died too quickly to give them any information. Uh, and the intelligence people who were who had infiltrated that and had witnessed the torture said they had bayoneted him from throat to to well to genitals. Mm -hmm. uh, and basically, Hoppy Hardy was standing over the body, screaming, hitting them with a gun while they're already dead. You know, this guy mm -hmm. was already psychopath. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what what the people had learned while they were observing their comrades being tortured was that the British had planned to uh, drive into Croke Park for what was going to be known as Bloody Sunday. Mm -hmm. So they quickly got word to Dublin Brigade, but it was too late. Um, British regular troops had already dro driven into um, Croke Park uh, during the, uh, the football match. Uh, where Tipperary was playing and had opened fire on the uh, civilian crowd, mm -hmm. killing 14 people. Yeah, there was two bloody Sundays and they, they get mixed up sometimes. This was the first one. Um, how many people were killed? 14. 14 okay. people were killed. So you're talking about a, a, a basically old school armored vehicle, I think, pulled in and just hosed the whole place down with a Vickers machine gun, right? As retaliation for those hits. Yeah, sort of a collective punishment, you know? Yeah, stupid thing to do. Huge mistake. You want to turn the whole population against you? Do some stupid shit like that. Massive problem. And it's funny, it, it was it was commonplace in, in the British Empire at the time. Uh, just about a year before that, in India, they did the same thing with the Amritsar massacre, where they opened fire on a, a bunch of Sikhs. You know, mm -hmm. if, if you ever talk to Sikhs today, they'll still not forgive them for that. You know, that was... Mm -hmm. Yeah, deeply, you know. So uh, essentially, it worked in Collins' favor almost that this happened. Uh, public opinion uh, was even hardened, you know. Mm -hmm. So, like, if, if you think back in 1918, two years before this, the Irish population, 85 percent of the entire country, voted overwhelmingly for Sinn Fein in the general election. Now they weren't voting for armed rebellion; they were just voting for this vague idea of freedom, right? But now people were saying, no, 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 we can't do this politically. We have to do this by physical force. Yeah, I, I think it, 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 it gives you a look into the mindset of the enemy, right? If they're willing to do this, then there's no, there's no talking to them, right? The, the, what, at what level was that decision made? That was at a, a high-end decision. That was Ormond Winters with Express. Uh, I, I, and you'll never see this because the, the, the British intelligence files are sealed for another 250 years. Wow. Did it come from Churchill? I, I would say it either came from Churchill or from Lloyd George himself. Yeah. Um, what was Churchill's role at this point? Churchill was basically, Ormond Winters and Churchill were very close. Um, Churchill essentially approved and created the auxiliary division that tortured and maimed throughout Ireland. Uh, he had approved. He had approved the black and tans, even though it wasn't his idea. What were the, uh, talk to me about the black and tans, real quick. Black and tans were um, ex-soldiers that had served on multiple fronts. Um, they had mixed uniforms because of a, a, a lack of uniform there. They're heavily armed. Uh, they had to. They had to be battle hardened and of a certain rank to get in there. Mm -hmm. So they were more experienced soldiers. What I would say is that uh, Churchill had mentioned, and I, I love the way they, the British do have um, these sayings, he says, we want a purposeful regime of frightfulness uh, for the Irish people, wow. which means yeah. we want 
state sponsored terrorism. A terror squad, right? A terror squad. And there's a, there's a misconception that the Black and Tans were criminals that were released from prison in England. You know what I mean? There there were combat veterans who uh, liked what they did and uh, were pretty much gloves off, right? Kind of go to Ireland and and do your thing, right? Well, as bad as the Black and Tans are, and they were, they did some serious atrocities. Most of the atrocities, like the ones that really stand out, were done by the auxiliaries. Uh, and the auxiliaries were specifically trained for counterinsurgency work. Um, so like the burning and sacking of Cork. Like, I mean, a, 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 again, a lot of these collective punishments, you know? Yeah, yeah. Balbriggan too, right? Balbriggan was burned to the ground, right? Yep, yep. Um, I I think, yeah, that, that uh, I tell you, counterinsurgency is a freaking difficult fight. It just is because you can't be a fucking, you can't be weak, but you overplay your hand, which the American military have done that. You overplay your hand, you come in too strong, you turn the whole fucking population against you, right? But there's a, there's a, there's a balance, right? You have to fucking win the hearts and minds, but you can't be was. You gotta, you get hit, you gotta hit back and it's a tough fight to win. And if that, if that, um, local population are willing to fight the long fight it's very because it drains that occupying force for years and years and years and decades and some times right it's a difficult fight and then you get soldiers who overplay they do something and if that came from the top it was really dumb but sometimes soldiers on the ground and i think the one the bloody sunday in 1972 was more of a on the ground decision by like a battalion commander maybe i don't think that came from higher but uh, i might be wrong but you get that and it just turns everything on its freaking head um so they come in they drive in they bust through the gates they go to a, a football match gaelic football match and they spray the crowd down and kill 14 people you said yep was it 14 that's right yeah yeah yeah, yeah. um then what so then what year was that I'm, I'm sorry what year was that that was uh july 1921 21 okay yeah and it was probably a turning point because it wasn't that long after that that the British were like, we're out, right? Yeah, it was I mean, like, uh, retaliation was very swift uh, with, with Collins. Collins found who had ratted out um, Clancy, uh, Clancy and McKee, and also this other fella, Clune, who, who was also tortured to death. A guy called uh, Shankers uh, used to, basically, he, he used to... Um, Hang around. He was a former British Army soldier himself. He used to hang around the Monto quite a bit and had followed these guys as they were coming back home to their lodgings. Uh, basically, Vinnie Byrne himself um, found out which bar Shankers used to go in to have his morning shot. And he walked right behind him, shot him in the back of the head. Mm-hmm. And, you know, that's how he ended that. Yeah. Uh, now, uh, basically, the violence started escalating and escalating. The Cairo gang was wiped out. So they brought in the Igo gang. And bear in mind, um, there's a lot of players in this. So during this period of time, people like Dan Breen and uh, Sean Tracy and all the rest were being co-adopted into the um, the uh, squad, essentially. You know, they're full-time uh, guerrilla warfare. Uh, 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 yeah, we're kind of concentrating on Collins, but uh, that was Dublin. But pretty much throughout the country, there was these flying squads hitting the British, hitting run tactics, right? Yeah. And, yeah. and, and like... It, 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 Breen was brought into Dublin to do a bit of work for for Collins as well, mm. uh, which is kind of interesting because the um, the Igo gang was being headed up by another fella, uh, but one of the sections of it was being headed by a guy called Smith. Smith's brother had been killed in Cork by uh, Sando Donovan, um, a friend of Collins, funny enough, and um, uh, basically the, his brother had this famous saying, um, you know, the more you shoot, the better I like you. You may make mistakes. Uh, but I can assure you that no one's going to be held to account if you kill a civilian. Mm-hmm. Um, basically, Sandra Dunn walked into the um, uh, into the man's house, pointed a gun at him and said, orders were to shoot on sight, you're in our sight, prepared to die and kill them. Mm-hmm. But unfortunately for Dan Breen, Dan Breen has been blamed for everything at that point. Yeah. So uh, they set up a, the Igo gang as well to, to kill him. Uh, your man's brother was heading up that uh, unit of the Igo gang uh, and attacked Dan Breen in the fern side. Dan Breen escaped, killed the brother as well, and went on his way. You know, so it was really brutal, close quarters fighting in, in an urban environment. 
for the mm-hmm. following year. If I could go back and if I could go back in time, I'd go back and put a GoPro camera on Dan Breen. Cause that he was a bad fucker, man. <laughs> and he was just hard. Um yeah, that was a tough man. We talked about him in one of the last podcasts, man. What a freaking yeah. Uh yeah, awesome guy. Um all right, so um retaliation. I, I, I assume all the hits kind of ramped up after Bloody Sunday. And at some point I mean, I know negotiations were going on, ongoing the whole time, but at some point the Brits pulled Collins, right, a small delegation out, and they went to England, I think, to get the the, the offer. So, so when that happened, some again, you know, uh, uh, for for the Doves and the Hawks on the British side, there's also the Doves and the Hawks on the Irish side. At this point, right after um, Bloody Sunday, uh, De Valera, who is doing this sort of goodwill tour of the United States at the moment, as the president of Ireland realized it's probably time to come home. Uh, so he came back, and he came back into an Ireland which had changed quite a lot. Now, there are some historians that look very negatively on, on De Valera, like people like Tim Coogan, but, you know, I, I think he's a bit biased in some ways. He can't, he's No one's all good or all bad. They just came with different opinions, you know? Mm-hmm. So De Valera came back, and uh, he had heard that a lot of people were calling, you know, the IRA murder gangs and so on. He didn't like it, and he thought there should be... Um, sort of a more open kind of warfare, which doesn't make sense really because, you know, a small nation against the entire mm. British Empire is not going to work. No. Mm-hmm. No. Nope. It's, it's not going to work. Now, he did have one or two good ideas. Now, during the middle of the negotiations in England, De Valera organized what the IRA would classify, and they've classified in, in, in later things in the 80s, 90s, and all the rest for the provisionals, is what they call a spectacular. Uh, and basically, they destroyed the customs house they burnt it to a crisp. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that was a massive attack on a financial center, which, you know, it, it did make a big difference. But the problem is it also got a lot of guys rolled up, a lot of important members of the IRA rolled up because of it, because it was a daylight attack. Mm. And Collins was furious about it. Now, the British didn't realize, the British intelligence didn't realize how badly that it may have affected Collins' operations. But I think it did factor into Collins accepting the truce. Mm. Uh, Collins probably realized uh, some essential members of mine got rolled up because of this operation I'm going to probably be more compliant with some of the, the negotiations now yeah. that being said you know uh, it's very much like towards the end of the 90s with provisionals people are always wondering how infiltrated people are they're talking to British intelligence um, are they being seduced are they being like you know turned like Collins hid for a very uh, oh, like it was hidden by Collins up until his death that he was talking with Andy Cole uh, prior to the truce. Um, but I think what's more telling is uh, his conversations with a guy called Roger McCorley, who is head of Belfast Brigade of the IRA. So really high up member of the Northern Division of the IRA during the, the truce. He's basically telling Roger McCorley, along with other members of the Northern Division of the IRA, he's like, look, this is probably what's going to happen. They're probably want, going to keep this. We hold tight for now, but we'll get the weapons, we'll get rearmed, and we'll go into the north by force. Because everyone sort of, and I, I think there's sort of either demonization or sanitization of Michael Collins. Uh, like you look at political parties now that want to claim him, like Fina Gale, they'd be saying, well, Collins was just hoping for a stepping stone, which would be a political stepping stone. It's like, that's not really his style. I mean, like, his style would have been, we'll hold on for now, and then when we get the arms, we're going to go in by force. Mm-hmm. You know, you make Belfast the next Dublin, essentially. Mm-hmm. Uh, and what, what makes me, what sort of furthers my belief in this is that after the truce was done and dusted, and as you said yourself, he signed his own death warrant, he was trying his best to prevent a civil war from breaking out. And you better believe British intelligence were probably stoking both sides mm-hmm. to try and get a civil war break out. Yeah. Now, during this period of time, they put a guy called Henry Wilson in charge of the North. Now, Henry Wilson was... The IRA did, or the Irish or the British? The British. The British okay, put this yeah. guy, Henry mm-hmm. Wilson, in there. And he was just one of the, the one of the worst people to have in there, really. Uh, basically, he ordered pogroms of the Irish population in the North. So mass killings. Mm-hmm. like uh, Basically, population control, pushing them down into Monon and Louth and to other places out of Belfast. Catholics, um, yep. Catholics, mm-hmm. And so Collins basically said, essentially, if I'm going to keep Northern Division of the IRA on side, 
and make sure this doesn't break off. I'm going to have to kill Henry Wilson, even though I've already agreed to a truce. So two IRA members, a guy called Reginald Dunn and Joseph uh, O'Sullivan, both World War I vets from the Psalm, one missing his leg, assassinated Henry Wilson in London mm. after the truce. They had a mm. biplane waiting for them to, to get away. Unfortunately, uh, because of Reginald's amputation, they couldn't actually physically get out of there quick enough. Mm. They were arrested and hanged. And shortly after their hanging, you know, uh, the Irish Civil War did break out, you know. Mm. Uh, so, uh, again, you know, the sad thing about it is during the Civil War, it's probably the most regretful aspect of Irish history because you had two sides, both wanting more or less the same thing, uh, having different approaches for it and uh, killing each other. Uh, yeah. yeah. Let's just go back, Ushin, real quick for people to understand. So Collins goes to England and he agrees to... Uh, basically a truce. It wasn't even the British leaving. They left it the, the south of Ireland and stayed in Northern Ireland. And he saw that as a stepping stone and we could launch in there with weapons and all that. And a lot of people thought he sold out the North, right? Now, in, in, you know, had he held firm, the war might have went on for decades. Had he, I mean, you just don't know, right? You make a decision and you move on. And um, why was De Valeria not in London doing this? A very good question. I, there's a lot of debate on that. I'm assuming he probably predicted that the negotiations would not end in anything meaningful. It would be a total failure of negotiations. He didn't want to be associated with a failure. Yeah. So probably didn't expect Collins to actually make a decision. I think I honestly think he underestimated Collins' uh, notion that he was a negotiator, and he probably yeah. thought Collins would just say. This is not my bag. I'm going to leave it and walk yeah. out. Yeah. Uh, I think as a politician, De Valera didn't want to be associated with that failure. That's a bit of a dick move. It was. It, it was poor. I mean. Yeah. I, I think. I think we will uh, look back on De Valera and Collins and look at both their strengths and weaknesses. I think De Valera probably probably is the most capable political mind that that Ireland had produced at that point, but certainly he didn't really have the instinct for intelligence work, nor do you have any sort of real military uh, ability either, you know? Yeah. And Collins yeah. So what, what, when this split, right? So Collins comes back, the British leave um, the south of Ireland, becomes the Republic of Ireland, right? They take the hand over there at Collins Barracks in Dublin, right? Which you wouldn't call that, I'm sure, at the time where I've done training, which is a museum now. Um, doesn't make you feel old at all when you did training at a base that is now a museum. Um and it was ghetto as hell, dude. It was ghetto. I'd love to go back there, man. I got to go back there because, uh, yeah, you, you can tour it now. But um, so at that point, what was the split? So when you had the people who supported Collins, what were they What were they known as? So uh, they were known as pro-treaty. Okay. Or free, staters. free staters. And the other guys? Uh, Anti-treaty or rebels. Okay. So now you have a very... The people who are all fighting in the one cause are now split in half. And some people who actually liked Collins and were loyal to Collins were now against him. Right, Dan Breen, I think, was against him, right? And he 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 has said that he actually liked Collins and respected him, but he didn't want this treaty. They saw it as selling out the North and, and settling, and they just want the British out, right? So now, now you have a broken system with two opposing sides. Do we know what the split was in percentage-wise? Very hard to say. I mean, like... So I think uh, I would say it's it's very hard to say. There's a lot of people who definitively took a side uh, either way, and there's some people who just said I don't want any part to do with this, and it's just left the scene, you know. Yeah, uh, don't be involved in killing their former comrades. I, right. I think the interesting thing was there was even splits within the squad itself. Yeah. So people like Paddy Daly, right? Who, you know, unusual for the squad. He was a mar he, he was a widower. He had multiple kids. He was very committed. Um, and then you had people like Sean Lamass, became a future Taoiseach of Ireland, also in the squad. Uh, and he went went the opposite way. He joined Fianna Fáil, was anti-treaty IRA. And, you know, to make things even more sad, like Sean Lamass's brother, who had very little to do with it, Noel Lamass, was captured by Nelligan, brought up the little man's tortured to death and killed. You know, I mean, like that's the kind of civil war you had there. You yeah. Know? And, it, you know, you say, you say the American Civil War is brother against brother, but this really was brother against brother, like literally. 
because um, it was just so much smaller and, and contained. Um, so they, they, sorry, go ahead. I was just saying the people who are really loyal to Collins, like Daly, Nelligan, um, Broy, it's no surprise they were so brutal after he was killed. So w- when he was killed in Bail and Law, basically these people, um, it's a good thing the British didn't kill him because if they did, if they did assassinate him, that anger would have been directed at them. Yeah. And um, the British did a master stroke there with with fermenting a civil war because the 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 actual anger was directed at some of the, the best and brightest from the Republican movement. Right. Uh, other members of the Republican movement. So like Paddy Daly was involved in some atrocities out in Kerry called the Bally City Massacre, which probably deserves a podcast all of its own. Um uh, uh, Oriel House was set up by like Liam Tobin, um, which was like, you know, a lot of torture went on there. Mm-hmm. Uh, so these guys were really brutal towards their own people. Mm. Um, and later on, you can see these fellas dis- after all of this being very disillusioned. People like Liam Tobin, who you know was very disillusioned, you know. Right. So when the split happened, anti treaty, pro treaty, they had a, a set piece battle in Dublin, right? At least one where they actually fought toe to toe and and did um, an open battle against each other. Did the British leave a lot of weapons behind that that uh, uh, pro treaty people fell in on and became the Irish Army? Basically, the the British actually supplied them with the weapons. Really, so they actually supplied them with the shells. They could shell the four courts with. Um, right. They 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 essentially you know um, realized that they could get these people to do their job for them. Right, and they didn't want these rebels going into the north. I assume so. If the if the Irish army at that point could kill them all, it would be it would make the north safer. I, I suppose that's what they were thinking, right? I think the big idea was, uh, I think the whole idea of the north essentially was for the British to have a foothold in Ireland, and they wanted to make sure that the idea of the south or the twenty six counties here. Would never really get off the ground financially, economically, and political stability wise, mm. and that it would collapse into a heap, and eventually they'd be there in the north, and they just reunify the country under under their rule again. Yeah, pretty arrogant. Um, what was in the north for them? Why did they want to keep the north? Uh, I think the main reason was was as I said, it was a foothold they could have to get the rest of the country back. But mm. secondly, they had some profitable things there at the turn of the century. They had shipbuilding, they had linen mm. works. The Titanic was built in Belfast. Not a great thing to put on your resume, by the way, but it was built there. The ship that sank. It, it's, it's a <laughs> ship that sank and the most blown up hotel. You know, I mean, like... <laughs> um, but you had a lot of tenant farmers that were Protestant, right, that wanted to stay a part of England, right? Yeah, I mean, and it, inversely, you also had a lot of English people who, who were very pro-Irish Republic as well. You had people like Erskine Childers, who was, you know, he was British. I mean, like, he was raised in England. He grew up there. His family, uh, obviously, he had land here in Ireland. He started seeing the deprivation here and felt sympathy for the cause and became not only a member of the IRA, but a member of the anti-treaty IRA. Mm. Uh, British really wanted to kill him, which they succeeded in doing via free state forces. You know, he was executed. Okay. Um, So Collins... Was, he was the commander in chief then at that point, right, of the Irish army, basically. And he go, why did he go to Cork when he went down, when he was killed uh, in ambush? What, what, what was that trip to Cork for? Was he going home or what? Well, no, there's a lot of suspicion about that. I, I think he was actually going to talk to Liam Lynch. Uh, okay. I, I think Liam Lynch was, people talk about De Valera as a counterpart to Michael Collins, but I don't think that's correct. I think Liam Lynch truly is the military counterpart to Michael Collins. Liam Lynch was an incredibly effective rural guerrilla warfare leader, uh, mm-hmm. anti-treaty uh, um, uh, politics, right? Uh, and just all around quite excellent in what he did, which was ambushing British soldiers. Mm-hmm. Um, Collins himself liked each other a great deal. Uh, and I think if Collins and himself actually sat down and met, I think some negotiation settlement would have taken place. But he was ambushed and he was killed in, in Bail and Law. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Collins uh, from history was a very personable guy, right? Very likable guy. Very, you know, he's just one of those guys that was able to talk and and, and get on with people, right? Uh, from what I've I've read and seen, right? Um, so, uh, they're rolling in convoy. Right? I think they did an armored vehicle or something with them, right? Yeah. And and they got ambushed in a, in a kind of lonely Cork 
area. Um, I think that vehicle is still around. I think that vehicle is actually in a museum. Uh, in the car, I think. Am I, am I right there? You're right, you're right, yeah. The one with the Vickers machine gun on it and all that? Yeah. yeah. So Collins was an intelligence man. He was not a soldier in the sense that he didn't have military training. Yep. Um, but he had people around him who did have military training. And um, he decided, instead of driving through the ambush to fight, uh, shoot back, yeah, and uh, Sonny O'Neill, uh, the British Army sniper and, and IRA uh, volunteer, um, shot him. You know, uh, uh, shot him in the head. You know, people. There's a lot of conspiracy theories about was he shot by someone in his convoy or whatever. There seems to be two two different sides. Like in reality, it's just the entry and exit wound look different, and they always do. You know, mm. so I mean, yeah, well, let's do weird things. Like yeah, the worst thing you can do is stop in an ambush site, right? If at all possible, you put the pedal to the metal and you go like a bat out of hell and get through the kill zone, right? So they stopped. They stopped in the ambush line and fought. And uh, did everybody get killed in the ambush or just a few? Just Collins. Yeah, he was the only one. I think he really? was the only one. A few people were injured, but I, I think Collins yeah. was the one who was. Yeah. So. Ambushed by anti-treaty forces. Collins is dead. How do we get back on track? How do we? How did the the Irish government squash the anti-treaty forces and move the hell on with their lives? Basically, how did that happen, and how long did it take? It took a while now. I mean, like you had a you had a civil war that took place, and and like I suppose civil war best best left to another podcast. But essentially, I would say. It was a series of atrocities uh, that took place that really had to stamp out uh, that sort of anti-treaty sentiment. Was it tit tit for tat killings kind of thing? Uh, it was more tat. Was it? It was the 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 registered government going, okay, you're anti-treaty, whack whack whack, right? That okay, wow, hit squads. Um, Paddy Daly, uh, and then bear in mind, like Paddy Daly and all the accounts will say this: that guy had severe post-traumatic stress kind of stuff going on after like he was a he was a fairly damaged individual going into the civil war um and he wasn't taking any prisoners literally like in the bally city massacre he tied people to landmines and set them off like you know wow yeah yeah you're damaged goods brother um what happened to him yeah well, he survived i mean like uh, it, 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 a lot of these guys were really just a little bit uh warped by the whole experience mm -hmm. um and then, of course, you know, I, I think it kind of did get rolled up by the execution. So, like, the, the Irish government at the time, the, the Free State Forces had 77 executions um, uh, of, of Irish uh, IRA volunteers. Wow. So, I mean, that quieted things down. Um, so, essentially, that kind of... The sad thing about it, though, is when you think about it, is this is all stuff taking place in the South. This is in the North we're talking about. Yeah. So, in the north, a lot of people uh, were very loyal to Collins, like incredibly loyal to Collins. Really? You would think it would be the other way around, right? You would think that they felt sold out, yeah. You would. Uh, but some people did. Like McKelvey was one of the IRA members in, in Belfast who was executed, one of the 77 executions. Yeah. Uh, but like people like uh, Roger McCorley, uh, really, really hardcore IRA members in the north, they all kind of believed Collins would you know, help them out. You know, he, mm. he they believe sort of second Ted offense was going to happen in the North. Mm. Let me ask you, let me ask you two difficult questions. Ocean. I'm going to put you on the spot. If you were fucking one of those guys, which side would you have went with? Jesus, that's a good question. Uh, would I, uh, in this scenario, would I know what I know now? No. Or would I be no. The guy? I, I would, uh, I would, felt, I would have felt sold out to be honest. Yeah. If I was in the would North. Would you? If you were in the north, but if you were one of the guys in Dublin fighting side by side with Collins, and he comes back and he goes, "Here's what's going to happen: Would you be pro treaty, anti treaty, and would you be enough of one or the other to fight?" That's a really good question. It's hard, uh, right? Very hard. I don't. I don't know. It, it really depends where I was and who I knew. I mean, if I was, if I knew Collins personally, and you know, if he, I had some inside information that he wasn't going to screw us over, I'd be like, "All right." I'll play along for now. And it's funny, a lot of people who became anti-treaty IRA people did play along for a period of time. Like mm -hmm. Tom Barry came up and talked with Collins for quite a bit. I was trying to stave off civil war as long as he could. Mm -hmm. 
We just couldn't. It's, I think it's impossible because you can't broadcast everybody. Don't worry, Lance. We're going into the north to invade. Mm-hmm. It's all right. Um, There's a lot of countries have a civil war early on. It's like a disease, man. It's best to have it when you're young and get it over with, right? Um, uh, yeah, it, it's it's an interesting thing. And then the second question is, what would have happened if Collins hadn't died? Do you think he would have did a military invasion into the north? Because th- at that point, the British army's coming in droves, right? And you have a freaking another set-piece battle with one of the most trained and professional armies in the world. And whatever about intelligence and hit hit and run and all that kind of thing, but if you want to do a set-piece battle with the British army who just got out of World War I, um, man, that's a lot of killing going on right there. Uh, it's funny, like, I mean, up until the point where um, uh, the... the, the when the truce was ending, uh, Winston Churchill wanted to use uh, mustard gas and biological warfare on the Irish. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> it's interesting, yeah. isn't it? Um, so, like, I mean, uh, I, I I think, personally, I think he, it really depends. I think if Collins had survived, it's. I think we would have probably, I think it probably would have been an invasion of the North, I, I don't know what, what the outcome would have been, but my opinion is if the British had killed him post-truce rather than mm. the Irish, there would have been wholesale murder. Like I, yeah. the People like Daly and Nelligan, all their fury wouldn't have been directed at their fellow Irishmen, it would be directed at the British. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, purely purely speculation, right? We never know. But it's an interesting it's an interesting topic to talk about. Um, how long, if you know, how long did we did it take to kind of settle this stuff out? Jeez, I, honestly, truth be told, I, I don't think it ever did settle out. I, I I think it rumbled along like everything does in Ireland. Yeah, there's probably families to this day that love him or hate him. You know, Irish can hold a grudge like nobody you've ever seen. Yeah, like my, yeah. my, my family split during the, the Civil War. Um, one side were very, very Republican. The other side I, I, were also Republican, but they were very loyal to Collins. Like yeah. uh, on my granny's side, her uncle was Collins' bodyguard in Cross McGlen in, in Armagh. Yeah, yeah. I bet I bet, I bet, bet that family had a, a picture of Collins, a picture of John F. Kennedy, and a picture of the Pope on the wall. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, the other side were um, were very much anti-treaty, but um, you know there'd still be some degree of animosity there. You know, mm-hmm. the, 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 the time, sorry, go ahead. At the same time, it it does mean that at the very least, some people hold principles. You know, I mean, mm. even if the grudge means they hold some sort of principle. You know, like people saying oh, we're all the same. It's you know, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, at some point you got to pick a side. You got to pick a team. Um, yeah. Uh, the uh, oh, I forgot what I was going to say. Mm, it'll come back to me. Freaking TBI. Uh, it, it, it's uh, it's a fact. Oh, the, the the very famous photograph of Collins, which I'll put up on the YouTube video of him walking with the Webley and the drop leg holster with a little kid behind him. Yeah, yeah. You told me before I can't remember. What's the context of that photo? Oh, jeez, I can't remember now. I think it, it it wasn't the treaty signing, but it was obviously after the treaty because he's in full uniform. Uh, he has the, the, I mean, he looks like British Army, man. They took the British Army uniforms and everything, I think. But uh, he's got the riding britches on. He's got the drop leg holster. And uh, it's a badass picture for some reason, right? I, 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 thought, I thought maybe when you, somebody told me the context of that before. And somebody can put it in the comments down below on the YouTube video. But uh, there, there, and there's a little kid behind him looking at him and it wasn't me before somebody says it i'm not that old <laughs> um yeah well, my, my my favorite photo of him uh is in the first doll where you just see him there like everyone's there for the very first meeting of the irish parliament yeah and you just see his arms crossed and the look in his face tells tells you this guy isn't about politics this yeah guy. yeah it's a whole new battle man whole new battlefield dirtier it's dirtier than the actual war right um Oshin, that was great, man. Thank you so much. It's it's very very interesting piece of Irish history. A lot of a lot of people just don't know. I learned a lot. Irish history goes back so far. Um, I remember learning it in in high school and just being bored to tears. If they had told me there was assassinations and hit squads, I would have paid more attention. Um, but 
it, it, it's you know those old European countries, man. That that it goes back freaking so far, and uh, it, the Irish War of Independence and the Irish Civil War. It's part of growing up, man. And um, there were people involved that that really, really did um, put their life on the line and 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 build the country to what it is today. So. Um, I really appreciate you coming on. It's always interesting. Um, people, when are you coming back to the States? Actually, I'm, I'm flying back uh, in a few months, actually. I'm, I'm going over to a conference there. What, where? I, I'm going to San Diego, but I'm flying back to North Carolina. And you are? A bit of time. Hell yeah, let's go shoot together, man. Let's go do a bit, do a bit of long range stuff. Um, yeah, we, we'll hit Coleman's Creek and we'll do, we'll do a little bit. I, I am... Uh, I'm heading out to Utah in October, November to train with the Marine Corps. And then I have a class in Virginia in December, which is sold out. And I'm looking to do more stuff. I'm looking to do more long-range stuff next year, like maybe, maybe kind of expand it a little bit. Um, but people can always do Zoom calls. I did two Zoom calls yesterday with guys. And uh, people love it, man, because you can sit down. It's individual training for you on what you need. Kirsten does Zoom calls too. Um but it's a great way to train from the comfort of your own home. So check that out. Oshin, thank you so much, brother. And uh, until next time, uh, I want to do this once a month if you can if you can swing it. There's like 50 people outside your waiting room now going, why is this guy not going? <laughs> All right. Thanks, brother. All right. Okay. okay. See you now. Bye.